Good evening, everybody. My name is Charlie, and uh, my wife Ruth is sitting on the back row there. And uh, it's lovely for us to be here to, as best we can, with God's help, to minister God's word to you. Because we need God's word, this book of books, the, the treasure trove. Without this, we would be a lot worse off. But as Christians, we have the word of God, we have the spirit of God. What more could we need? What more could we need? We have Christ as well. So that's just truly wonderful. Let's just come and still ourselves. Father, you are great and awesome, magnificent. You are the creator God. Through Christ, you are the sustainer God. And through the spirit of God, through your spirit, Lord, you are the God who enlivens the lives of people who turn to you. Mm -hmm. Father, enliven and quicken us tonight. God Almighty, please, because we need you. Mm -hmm. We all need you, Lord, in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. Come, Lord, by your Spirit and do something special with us and for us and to us this evening. We pray in the name of our Saviour, your precious Son, Jesus. Amen. 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 I'd like to read one psalm to you as we uh, begin, and it is Psalm 26. Psalm 26. <coughs> Just for your information, it doesn't really matter, but my translation is the New American Standard. Just so you know. I'm not saying this is better than... Well, it's better than some, but I'm not going to draw any comparisons with any particular Bible translation just at this moment. So Psalm 26 says, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Examine me, O Lord, and try me. Test my mind and my heart. For thy loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. I do not sit with deceitful men, nor will I go with pretenders. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I shall wash my hands in innocence, and I will go about thine altar, O Lord so that I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and declare all thy wonders. O Lord, I love the habitation of thy house and the place where thy glory dwells. Do not take my soul away along with sinners, nor my life with the men of bloodshed, in whose hands is a wicked scheme and whose right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity, Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on a level place. In the congregations I shall bless the Lord. Amen. May God indeed bless that word of his to us as it applies to us and it does apply to us. A psalm of David, we'll be looking, touching upon another psalm of David this evening. But this is a contrast here, but a bit like Psalm 1 I would suggest. Contrast between the bad people, the wrong people, the ungodly people, and those who are of God. And we're of God. So we, we shun and we don't look at the things that David was looking at which are wrong. No. We, we, concentrate, on, we concentrate on the Lord Jesus. We have to. We want to. We must. Because otherwise, well, we take our salvation rather cheaply if we just don't focus all the time on the living Lord Jesus. Let's begin our fellowship or continue it now with the first of four hymns which we're going to sing this evening. It's number nine in Mission Praise. All glory, Lord and honour to thee, Redeemer King. So shall we stand and, and sing this one please? number nine.
that we have to sing <laughs> Ruth and I were at a meeting yesterday and Ruth was at the front leading some songs it was a, it was a mini conference and the Lord loves um, us to make a cheerful sound to him he, he loves uh, the praises of the people and there was one gentleman there Christian, born again who got the rhythm all wrong and he was out of tune a lot and I felt sorry for Ruth because this brother in Christ had a loud singing voice. And it was quite difficult. I was standing quite ne near him and I found it difficult and Ruth was leading the worship. But you know that man's heart was in the right place because he was singing with gusto, with good intent to God. And God didn't hear him singing out of tune. <laughs> God... God God didn't hear him singing ahead of everybody else, got the rhythm wrong. No, God appreciated that man's singing. So whether we sing like an opera singer or, or we sing as a pub singer, then it doesn't matter if it's, it's the intent of our heart, isn't it? So, um, yes, that was, hmm, that was a challenge for Ruth and a bit for me because I was standing quite close to him. And there we are. But so we, we have the opportunity to sing to the Lord to worship the Lord, give him our praises. Uh, we're going to look tonight at, at, at a theme which goes throughout the whole of Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation. Now, don't worry, we're not going to go through each book, <laughs> otherwise we'd be here till midnight. But there are themes in Scripture, are there not? There are principles in Scripture. There are concepts in Scripture. And many of them span the entirety of the Holy Scriptures. Not surprising, because when we consider that Almighty God, through the inspiration of the Spirit, led men to write what God wanted them to write. Not automatic writing, but he inspired them <coughs> to write in their own styles what God wanted them to write. So it's no surprise that we have a theme which we're going to look at tonight. The theme is darkness and light. That's the theme, or light and darkness, whichever way you want to put it. And we begin in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and just the first three verses of the first chapter in the whole of the Scriptures. And it says, Genesis 1.1, 1, 1. we all know these scriptures, don't we? But we'll read them to remind ourselves. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void. And darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. 
Now, there's a principle of separation of light from darkness. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. But as Christians, we have him in us. We have the spirit of Christ dwelling in us. That's, by definition, what makes us Christians, to have God in us. We are meant to be light of, in, into the world. Scripture says that in, I think it's Matthew 6 or 5, somewhere around there, in the Sermon on the Mount. You are the light of the world, it says there. Christ is the light, but we are lights in the world. Separated from the darkness. The darkness, as we read in Scripture, can mean the physical phenomenon like it's dark out there now at 20 to 7 on a Sunday evening in the winter but so often darkness means refers to a, the spiritual state of people's dark, being in darkness and yes whether it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon in June or 6 o'clock tea time in June when it's nice and light people are in darkness but as Christians we're not there's that separation. We're not in darkness. We are in Christ. We are, uh, we are beneficiaries of the light. And this, this, this proves here that God is the God of creation. Because then God said in verse 3, let there be light. And of course, those words aren't in scripture, but I've added them. There, there was light. I have another Bible translation which says in relation to that verse, then God said, light be. It was a command. God created light and he placed it be. He placed it for in, in, in the planet Earth. Let's call it that. So we have <coughs> darkness to begin with in verse 2 and then dispelled, sh scattered, shattered, the light came. God produced the light. And as we know, as Christians, it's only the Lord God who has produced light in our lives. Through Christ, through faith, through God's grace, giving us this salvation, God's mercy in withholding his judgment on those who are born again. It's God, God, God. That's why in all humility we come before him, not boasting in anything of ourselves, because... We, we, we can't, we mustn't. What, what have we got to boast about? Nothing. I might be the fastest runner on the planet, but I'm not, by the way, never was. But if I were the fastest runner on the planet, what, what, what's good to boast about that? If I wasn't a Christian, I would be living in darkness. And that's a terrible, shocking state in which to be, to live in darkness. I said this theme runs throughout Scripture. And going to the final chapter of the scriptures, Revelation, of course, chapter 22. Just a, a reference here. This, of course, is talking about the, the future future, about the new heavens, new earth, how it's going to be. It gives us a glimpse of eternity with God. It gives us a glimpse of what Eden would, would have been like. It's returning to Eden in man's unfallen state, just beyond our wildest imaginations, I'm going to suggest. So in chapter 22, we have in verse 5, it says, And there shall no longer be any night, and they shall not have need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God shall illumine them, and they shall reign forever and ever. So God who started where there was darkness and created light. <clears throat> Christ is the light of the world. He is our light. He is our life. And for eternity, there won't be a sun. There won't be street lamps. There won't be headlamps. There won't be any lamps of any description because God will be the light. And this is what we've got to look forward to. In the meantime, we live in wherever we live, in the UK, here in England, and there is darkness all around, spiritual darkness all around. And I want to read another scripture in Matthew chapter 4, please. 
Matthew chapter 4, starting at verse 12. Matthew 4, 12 begins and continues thus. It says, Now when he, that's Jesus, heard that John, the Baptist, had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfil what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. And to those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death, upon them a great light dawned. Now, of course, Matthew's gospel was written after Christ had lived, died, risen, ascended. So it's in the past tense. But as it says, this has come from Isaiah. Actually, it's come from the Lord God because he wrote the book of Isaiah through the agency of a person called Isaiah. So this is looking back to what Isaiah had said about people who were sitting in darkness, spiritual darkness. Spiritual darkness because God had not spoken to them until the advent of Jesus. Because we look at the book of Malachi, the last book in the Hebrew Scriptures, and between Malachi and and Matthew, or the advent of Jesus really, it's, it's called the intertestamental period between the testaments, and God did not speak. God was silent. We have no scriptures in the canon of scripture dealing with about 400 years. A long time. A long time for people not to be spoken to by God. What did people do when they, or what do people do when they have no recourse to God? What do people do when they don't look to God? What do people do when God is silent? What do people do when they push God to the sidelines? In fact, they push God way off as far as they can. People do whatever they want to do. It's a free-for-all. People set their own standards of morality. People decide what is good and what is evil and what is evil and what is good. That's what people do. When there is no ultimate authority in their lives, people become their own authority. And this national government will do this, and this national government will do that, this regional government will do so and so. Without reference to God, it becomes, well, is your opinion, is your opinion any better than mine? Well, we all... We just get by. And that's what was happening, you see, because by the time of Malachi, the priesthood, the Mosaic priesthood, we could call it, had gone all rotten. And people were worshipping... They were worshipping God in a wrong way. And they were worshipping other gods in whatever way they, they thought was right. They, they were forming their own standards. They were making their own rules and regulations. It's no wonder, therefore, that God became silent. But there came a time when God didn't become silent. He spoke through the person of Jesus Christ to the people who were sitting in darkness. They were in darkness because of the spiritual depravity in which, in which they were. So that's why they were sitting in darkness. And they saw a great light. What was this great light? Actually, rather, the better question is, who was this great light? We know it was Jesus. So God stepped down into mankind in the person of Jesus, his son, in the person of himself, we could say, and he was a great light. And to, he, he, was, he came to those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death. Upon them a light dawned. The advent of Christ. Wonderful. Wonderful. And after 400 years, what happened? Did people accept Christ? Well, you can read Romans 1 and you can see, by and large, by and large, no, they didn't. Many did, but the establishment didn't. They continued in their darkness. They, they, they continued 
in the man-made system of religion which they had invented rather than turning to Christ to honour God and to worship God in spirit and in truth. This is the base human nature of unregenerate people. They want to do things their own way in their own time and they reject God. The Spirit of God can convict them of that but it takes the Spirit of God to do that because we can't persuade them by human words of wisdom or cleverness of speech. Scripture tells us that. That's the case. So, God was good and gracious that after such a span of time, 400 years or thereabouts, the greatest gift to mankind was given. And we are the beneficiaries of that, aren't we? we we've received Christ. If... if, if we have received Christ and given our life to him. If we haven't received Christ, if you, I don't wish to be confrontational here, I'll just say you generally, if you haven't received Christ, you are still in darkness. You are still in darkness and you need to come to the light. <coughs> the light is attractive. You need to come to the light. Shall we stand please and sing our second <coughs> hymn tonight? Number four, six, four, 464, praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Number, f number 564, thank you. reference to Isaiah chapter 9 which was quoted in Matthew would be beneficial to us so Isaiah chapter 9 uh, beginning at verse 1 and reading just the first couple of verses <coughs> Isaiah chapter 9 
But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on he shall make it glorious. By the way of the sea, on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine upon them. When it says that the land of Zebulun and Naphtali was treated with contempt, when the people were exiled away previous times, then these were the, some of the first people who were taken away. That's just what that means. But that's not the point of this particular uh, scripture here. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, it says in verse 2. That expression, dark land, comes from a Hebrew word, which comes in turn from two other Hebrew words, shadow and death. Darkness is, is death. Not physical death, as we pass away, whenever we pass away, but it's just death. The wages of sin is death, doesn't it? Scripture tells us that. So sin is darkness. There, there is a link between them. There, I won't go into this, but there are different words in the Greek for, for darkness. Skotos, skotia. And it, they symbolise sinfulness and, and the consequences of sin. But that, that's maybe not for today. But shadow and death, from those two words come the word dark land, which we have here in Isaiah. A deep shadow or a death shadow, this is the, people, this is the, the situation of the people who were living in a dark land. Shadow, death. Didn't we read in Matthew chapter 4 from the quotation there? And to those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death. Shadow of death. Psalm 23 comes to mind, I would suggest. Because in Psalm 23, it says, doesn't it? Psalm of David, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. And this is a principle for, for us Christians. Darkness is all around us. In Colchester, Ipswich, London, Saffron Walden, Milton Keynes, Birmingham, Sheffield, you name it, it's in the world. It's sinfulness. It is of the devil. It's of Satan. There you are. This is getting a bit absolutely blunt now and hard-hitting. Satan is the prince of darkness. He operates in darkness just as a lot of nefarious activity, a lot of naughtiness and criminality goes on under the cover of darkness, physical darkness. This is how... Satan operates. He loves the darkness. He's the author of the darkness. And that's how he works. It's all around us. But as Christians, we can say, as David said in Psalm 23, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, darkness, I fear no evil, for you are with me. God, you are with me. So this is good news. We're coming to some good news now. It's mingled with the bad news because to appreciate the good, we have to understand the bad, rather like the gospel message. We're sinners and we need to be saved. So what's sin and what do we need to be saved from? And then we, that, that unravels the gospel message. So we can say, as David said, we're not afraid. We're not afraid of the darkness. I... Grew up in a town called Lowestoft, up from here, on northeast of here, on the coast. Famous for being the most easterly town in the UK. Ness Point in Lowestoft is the most easterly point of the UK. Although maybe not so famous, I don't know. It really depends if you've heard of Lowestoft or Ness Point. <clears throat> but Lowestoft was also quite famous at one point, I'm not sure whether it still is, for a group of musicians... I, I, yeah, they are musicians, but I, perhaps I use the term loosely. A group, I would, would have called them a pop group because of my age. We had pop music. But this group, are far from being pop, the group that came out of Lowestoft were, I think there were four young men called The Darkness. That was the name of their group. <clears throat> they called themselves, and they still do, The Darkness. Don't watch their videos. 
don't listen to their music. It's not pop music, jolliness. It's heavy metal music. Don't go there. I had a quick look at one of their videos in the run-up to today, and I turned it off after about 10 seconds, if that. Satanic, demonic. The darkness, that's the, what they call themselves, it speaks for itself. And there's so much in the music industry, there's so much in the film industry, there's so much in the media that is of darkness. And so much of Disney is of darkness. So much of the cartoons that, well, that, I don't know whether you have cartoons still these days, maybe, you, I don't know, are of darkness. So much that you see on television is darkness. The devil <coughs> is, it <coughs> talks about in scripture that Satan being the prince of the power of the air. Airwaves. And I'm no scientist, I, I don't really know what I'm talking about, but that's how these things are transmitted, aren't they? Through the air. Social media. A lot of what's on there is of darkness. So the challenge for us, well, one challenge for us, and as Christians, we should often take stock <clears throat> excuse me, of, of where we are at, where our priorities are, where our focus is. What sort of things do we look at? What sort of music do we listen to? With whom do we associate? Because there's a lot of darkness all around us. But we don't need to be afraid of the darkness because... Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me, for God is with us. Mm. But we do need to play our part and focus on, the, on Jesus Christ, on our Saviour, day by day, day by day. Because this darkness wants to engulf us. This darkness wants to constrict our Christianity. <clears throat> and it, it's having some success. Freedom of speech is being eroded in this country. There are certain things which if you say in certain places, somebody will, will use the O word. I, I'm offended at what you say. Well, that's a buzz word. They're not offended. They just don't agree with you. And they know that they say, that's offending me, that the authorities will get involved and they're the good guys and you're the bad guy. This is the force of the darkness. There are certain, <clears throat> um, to use a, quite a recent example, the law has been passed concerning protesting or just even standing outside and praying about outside hospitals, abortion clinics. Now, whatever you think of abortion, I think it's totally wrong. It, it's a misnomer. It's a euphemism for the termination of a life. But that's not the point of what I'm saying. Freedom of speech is being eroded. Freedom of movement is being eroded. There are, there are exclusion zones being put in place. You will not go there and pray. You will not go there and protest. That's, when these things are happening, you know that they are tangible proof that the darkness is all around and it's closing in. But we don't need to be afraid. Freedom of movement is coming because travel is going to be hard hit in this country with our motor vehicles. It's happening in Oxford now. I can tell you afterwards if you wish. But there are certain restrictions on travelling. Darkness is all around. It it's, wants to engulf us. But we do not need to be afraid, as David was not afraid. Why don't we need to be afraid? <coughs> and let's look at John chapter 1. We don't need to be afraid of the darkness because we look to the light. John chapter 1 Verse 1, commonly called the, the part of the prologue to John's Gospel. John <clears throat> chapter 1, verse 1, says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. Hallelujah. Amen. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not, my trans translation says, comprehend it. 
which is not a good translation, comprehend, because to comprehend something means to understand it. The darkness does understand Jesus Christ. Satan knows who Christ is, and he's scared of him. Satan may or may not be scared of you as an individual, or me, but he's very scared of Christ. Look at the temptation of Christ, as it's called. Those three events which took place when the devil tried to get the better of Christ. And each time it was a no contest. It was a knockout before the contest had even begun, to use a boxing analogy. Jesus could never lose to Satan. Amen. Satan thought he'd won when Christ was on the cross and he died. No, the winner was Christ. That was the victory on the cross, not for Satan, but for Christ. We know that. But Satan doesn't give up. And this darkness is all around us. The better translation, rather than the darkness did not comprehend it, would be the darkness did not overpower it or succeed in defeating it. Because it cannot. Darkness cannot defeat, overcome, succeed against the light, who is Christ. Jesus Christ, the Saviour, the Messiah, God's own Son, God's only Son, who came to defeat the powers of darkness. He came to destroy, it says in 1 John, I think it is, or 2, one, yeah, 1 John, I think, um, the Son of Jesus came to de destroy the works of the evil one. And that word destroy, which most translations use, is again not the best word. It means to render them ineffective, mm. to neuter, to emasculate the works of the evil one. Christ is the victor. So we have no fear of the darkness, but we need to be aware of it. The darkness did not overcome it or overpower it. I sometimes use this illustration, this um, you, you will think it's a good one or not, but I, I, I believe it's quite <clears throat> apposite and, and appropriate. A ship at sea floats, because it's meant to. All around the ship is the sea, is water. The ship doesn't sink, because water is all around the ship. The problem comes when water gets into the ship, for some reason or another there was an accident or there was a faulty workmanship and there was a loose, the rivets come off or however the water gets in the ship, there's trouble. When the water gets in the ship, the ship becomes waterlogged. It becomes less effective because water is very heavy, weighs a lot. And it will impair and impede the voyage of the ship. It will make it less stable from what it should, should be. So if the water gets in the ship, there's a problem and it will affect the stability and the voyage of the ship. But if too much water gets in the ship, the ship goes down. That's the illustration. Darkness is all around us and we're like that ship on the ocean, on the sea. Darkness around us, as long as it's around us, we're okay. As long as we don't concentrate on it, and we don't let it affect us, this evil, this darkness, we're okay. But as soon as we let the darkness come into us, like water coming into the ship, it's going to affect our lives as Christians. It will affect our walk with God. It will affect our sanctification. If we allow too much darkness to come in, then, like a ship, we sink. So the darkness... For a Christian, I'm going to suggest, the darkness is not the problem. Because Christ has overcome the darkness. We have Christ in us. The darkness isn't the problem. You and I can be the problem. Because we let the darkness in. Much in the same way, do you remember the... Ruth has just finished reading a book about the uh, disaster in Zeebrugge. About 20 years ago, was it Ruth? Or 30 years ago? when there was a ferry coming from Zeebrugge, I think, across to Harwich or Felixstowe, and they uh, left Zeebrugge, they were leaving Zeebrugge Harbour, or Zeebrugge, if you want to be a bit continental, and the front part of the ship, which comes down to let the vehicles on, was still down. So the ship started off from the quayside with the, front, with the bow down, and of course, within 100 yards, 50 yards, 200 yards, whatever, all the water came in and the ship 
capsized. The water got in the ship. Disaster. So, the, the darkness, evil, all around us, is not a problem for us as long as we keep our eyes on Christ. Because the darkness cannot, did not overcome Christ. And if we stick close to Christ, the darkness cannot overcome us. That's the good news. So this message this evening, look at scripture. Yes, is we have to acknowledge and recognise the bad news and the, the, just the, the stain of, the, of darkness. And then put that to one side and say, Hallelujah, I'm born again, saved by the blood of the Lamb, purchased, redeemed by Christ. And that darkness is darkness that's for others but not for me because I'm looking to Christ it says in was it uh, where are we can I find it quickly um, we read earlier didn't we uh, or was it in a different psalm forgive me a second uh, yeah psalm 26 we, I read at the beginning and it says towards the end of psalm 26 verse 11 of psalm 26 but as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. <clears throat> I've been redeemed. And if you're a Christian, you have been redeemed. The picture here is of a slave market. When they used to have slaves, they still do in certain places. I believe they have them in the UK as well. Modern, modern day slavery. But in, in those olden days, there would be a market and you could go along with your money and there'd be slaves and you could choose a slave and you could buy that slave for yourself that's the picture of redemption for Christians we were in a worldly market as slaves to sin in bondage under the dominion in Satan's kingdom that's what we were but we were purchased, bought by the blood of Christ, taken out to be separate to be holy to walk with Christ, no longer to be tossed around by the, the, the waves on the sea, by, the, by, the, by Satan and, and his demonic realm, and the principalities of darkness, which are referred to in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, for example. So no, we, we, don't, we needn't concern ourselves with those as long as we're not letting in the darkness. I've referred already, haven't I, to being careful what we watch, on screens it can be a tablet it can be a phone it can be a television it can be a cinema screen that's an old-fashioned word cinema isn't it i don't know whether they still use that pictures when i was a boy we used to go to the pictures <laughs> we can let in the darkness through our eyes we can let it in through our ears what music we listen to who we listen to at work do we engage in sort of gossip at work that's darkness it's the works of satan it's not scriptural and the company that we keep is very often dark. But that won't affect us because we must go to work and work amongst non-Christians. If we play sports, we play sports. Football, rugby, basketball, I don't know, whatever sport. And most people will be non-Christians. So we don't disassociate ourselves from people. We don't go and sit on a pole in the middle of nowhere. No, we are meant to be in the world to have this positive effect as light. But we've got to be careful when we are associating with whoever it is in whatever context. Because if they're not Christians, they are of the darkness. They are of the darkness. Shall we sing again, please? And the third hymn is number... 760 which will instruct us because the chorus is trust and obey part of what I'm talking about tonight is focusing on Christ shunning the darkness in order to do that we must obey what it says in scripture so shall we sing please number 760 <clears throat> Thank you. 
abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but it's smart quickly drives it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sign nor a tear, can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief nor a loss, not a frown nor a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of his love, until all on the altar we lay For the favour he shows And the joy he bestows Are for them who will trust and obey Trust and obey For there's no other way To be happy in Jesus Trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go, never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Yes, amen. That's, uh, that's a truism, that expression, trust and obey. It's taken from Scripture because that's what we are called to do, to trust our Saviour and to obey the commands of Scripture. Some people... Not us, I'm sure. Some people, maybe even some Christians, would think that the Hebrew Scriptures, and I tend to call them that rather than the Old Testament, but we can call them the Old Testament if it makes sense to you. Some people think the Old Testament was full of commands, thou shalt, thou shalt not. Whereas the New Testament is much more fluffy and acceptable. No commands in the New Testament, are there? Well, the New Testament is packed with commands. Trust and obey what it says in scripture I made reference earlier to and I've just found it now it's in Matthew chapter 5 uh, you, you can turn if you wish but you don't have to Matthew chapter 5 verse 14 Matthew chapter 5 part of the Sermon on the Mount as it's called the, the Mount of Beatitudes Jesus giving instruction commands and in Matthew 5, 14 and 15 and 16, it says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do men light a lamp and put it under the peck measure, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So the challenge is, isn't it? Did I mention it earlier? I can't remember. Do people see Jesus today in the world? Well, no, but they do because Jesus is in us and the light of Christ should 
shine through us. It says there, that's what you are, the light of the world. And you should not keep that effervescence, that phosphorescence. Phos is the actual Greek word from which we get phosphorescent. It's a bright, gleaming, sparkling, whoa, radiant light. That's what's in us. That's who is in us. So, that's the challenge. <coughs> Consider. Maybe that's the second challenge this evening. One is, wh wh where are you? What darkness are you absorbing? What darkness, if any, are you taking in? Through the eyes, the ears, and with people with whom you fellowship. And then, are you being Jesus to people on earth? Now, of course, you are not Jesus, and I, I am not Jesus. I'm not saying we are gods. No, I'm not. But we have God in us. And he, he surely must make a difference in our lives. A difference which people can see, should see. Please, yes, he should make a difference. To one degree or another. I hope he does. When... <clears throat> Saul was going to Damascus in his rage and in his determination to persecute Christians. He met the living Lord Jesus, didn't he? He had an encounter with Christ. Much later on, after persecution and arrest, Paul was taken before Agrippa, King Agrippa. And in Acts chapter 26, as part of Paul's defence explanation to Agrippa... Paul told King Agrippa some of the words of Christ. That's a good way to evangelise, isn't it? Tell people the words of Christ. They can't argue with that. They can argue with your opinion, but they shouldn't really argue with the words of Christ. Mm -hmm. So Paul was telling Agrippa what Jesus had said to him. <coughs> and from verse 15 <clears throat> in Acts 26, just reading three or four verses, Acts <clears throat> chapter 26 verse 15 and I said who are you Lord and the Lord said I am Jesus whom you are persecuting but arise and stand on your feet for this purpose I have appeared to you to appoint you as a minister and a witness not only to the things which you have seen but also to the things in which I will appear to you delivering you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God in order that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. What wonderful words. What special words. I could talk about those for quite some time, but I won't, because we're looking at just maybe verse 18. Paul's minist God's ministry through Paul was to open people's <coughs> eyes so that they could turn from this wicked, pernicious, evil darkness driven by Satan, under the dominion of Satan, so that people could have the ability, by faith in Christ, to turn from that darkness to the light, to Jesus. It's only God who can do that. But God uses people. Paul here, maybe some of us, maybe should be using all of us, if we're willing, to explain these matters so that people can then have the ability to turn away from this darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God. There we are. It doesn't come any simpler than that, does it? It says it there in black and white, although it's a red letter Bible, so it's in red and white. But it says it there as clear as anything. People have got to turn from darkness to light. They can do. And from the dominion or the authority, the kingdom, the grip and the grasp of Satan can turn to God to receive forgiveness of their sins. This is great news. We have, if we are Christians, received forgiveness of our sins. We are in communion with God. We have fellowship with God. Fellowship in the Greek is koinonia, which by implication, by definition, involves participation. 
So fellowship, our fellowship as Christians involves, it should do, because this is what is implicit in the word koinonia, fellowship, participation. Participation with each other and participation with God. He wants to participate with us in reaching people so they can turn from darkness to Christ, from the evil, wicked, filthy Satan to God. And God uses people just like us to do that. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that humbling? Isn't that, doesn't that give, have the wow factor? It, it certainly does to me. And maybe the final scripture which we look at uh, this evening is in Colossians. Or maybe it's the, no, no, sorry, let's go to one more. I've referred obliquely to this. It, it, it's in Luke 23. Luke chapter 23, uh, the latter part of Luke 23 deals with the crucifixion of Christ. And then in verse 44, Luke chapter 23 verse 44 says, And it was now <clears throat> about the sixth hour, and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. That's why Satan would have thought he would won. he had won. I referred to that earlier without referring to that particular scripture. Satan is the king of darkness, the prince of darkness. He thrives in darkness, in this moral depravity, the absence of God. Satan would have thought with Jesus being died, having died, dying there, darkness, that's the realm in which Satan operates. Did he win? No, of course he didn't win. But there was darkness for three hours. Can you imagine that? I would have hated to have been there. But that's the state in which the world is. People are. They're in darkness. They're existing. They're alive. Biologically, they're alive. But spiritually, they're just existing. And they're waiting for their day of judgment where, they will be, where their guilt will be confirmed. So it's important that we shine our light. It's important that we allow Jesus to shine through us. Personally, I have no light, no real ability, no good looks, no charisma as a person, me, Charlie. But Christ in me, Christ in you, he's the difference. The darkness cannot withstand the light. The darkness did not, as it said, as we read earlier, comprehend did not overpower or succeed against the light. It cannot. Jesus said, in another place, I will build my church. In Matthew 16, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We're on the winning team, brothers and sisters, folks. We're, we're winners through Christ, not through our ability, not through our strength, but through him who keeps us. So the, the final scripture is in Colossians. <clears throat> Colossians, it's Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, uh, Colossians chapter 1. And we'll read verses 13 and 14. Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14 say, For he, referring to the Lord Jesus, for he delivered us from the domain or the authority of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins and he is the image of the invisible god and the firstborn born of all creation we're going to coming to an end of our time tonight in this setting and I think there are some refreshments but isn't it good to end we must end on a high note we must not concentrate on the darkness because Satan's a loser but he has power and if we allow him to push his darkness in our face in our eyes in our ears even in our mouth if we become gluttons gluttony is a sin if we allow him to have sway over us and to shove the darkness at us then he will gain some ground the water will come in the ship and we've got a problem but 
We don't concentrate on that. We don't need to. We are safe as long as we follow the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has delivered us from Satan. He's delivered us. He's taken us out. We've been removed from Satan's grip. And Satan's grip is very, very strong on many, many people. But Jesus has come along and he's delivered us from that grip of Satan it transferred us I used to play rugby years ago yes believe it or not I could run at one point and all the rest of it and to get the ball off somebody could be quite difficult because I wasn't the strongest a lot of people stronger than me and they'd get the ball and they'd hold it how could you get the ball off them it was a wrestling match arm wrestling the way to do it would be to get their fingers and prize their fingers back because you can do that I can do that against the strongest man in the world if he is gripping something if I get his fingers and peel them back I can release the grip and that's what Christ has done that's what our saviour has done he's released us from the grip the iron grip of, that Satan has over so many people and the grip that Satan had over me and he had over you when, before you became a Christian. But Jesus came, <laughs> the strong. He's stronger than the devil. And he released us from that grip. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, there's that word again, the forgiveness of sins. So we say hallelujah, thank you Lord Jesus. Without you, we'd be in that grip. Without you, we'd be in darkness. Without you, we'd be a ship in the water that was leaking all the time. And, and our lives would be hopeless and helpless. And we wouldn't be fit for purpose as human beings. But because of Christ, because of Christ, and only because of him, we are saved, delivered, transferred, redeemed, and walking with him, with Christ. And that's all that's going to keep us in these days. There's much more I could say about what, what has been going on this last week. I'll just touch upon this in Davos, in Switzerland. 16th to the 20th of January, just gone. The World Economic Forum has had its annual conference. They missed it because of COVID, but they're back again. The World Economic Forum is made, of, made up of many intelligent super-intelligent, wealthy people. But they're anti-God. And what comes out of Davos, what comes out of the World Economic Forum, filters down through societies all over the world. And we're heading towards <coughs> unity, cooperation. Because what we're facing is what they call a polycrisis. Crisis upon crisis, many crises, as in poly, many, many crises. And they want to solve it. They want to solve it in ways which exclude God totally. And that's why things are happening in the world. That's why the world is not only dark now, but it's going to get darker. But enough of that. We've been transferred, delivered from the domain of darkness, transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. Keep our focus on Christ and we will be safe. We don't let the darkness in and Christ, the good shepherd, will lead us and protect us as only he can. Our final hymn this evening is... Number 575, five. Rejoice the Lord is King. Hallelujah. I believe I've more alluded to that, in, in more than alluded to that this evening. I've said it in definite terms. Jesus is King. He has the authority and the power over Satan. So please, let's rise and sing number 575.
salvation we have joy in our salvation and we say bless you bless you thank you heavenly father for sending christ into the world to do what only he could do the rescuer the deliverer the one who has taken us out delivered us from the domain of darkness the realm of satan and has transferred us into the into the glorious kingdom of light the glorious kingdom of life thank you father hallelujah thank you lord that we can see from your scripture lord you are the great teacher Lord, you tell us all that we need to know about human nature, about the world around us. Thank you, Father, for this inspired word that we've been reading this evening. Thank you, Father, for the whole gamut of Scripture, the whole canon of Scripture, Lord, that's been put together to show your character, Lord, and the character of human nature. Father, lead us on in the days ahead and help us all, Lord. Help us, help us, please, almighty God. Help us because we need your help. Help us, Lord, to live lives which are worthy of the calling which you have placed upon us. Help us, almighty God, to keep the darkness at bay, to shun the works of evil, and to keep our focus on our Saviour, the living, reigning, loving Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name, Father, we come to you as ever. Amen. Amen. Amen.